My name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and welcome to Ultrasound Basics. We're going to go over an introduction to ultrasound, which is meant for people who are probably picking up the probe for the first time, or maybe you took a course a while ago and uh, want to see what all the kids are doing these days. So I'm going to start off with some physics, but it's going to be very focused on looking at how ultrasound works. And uh, we can just follow the example of bats because they've been doing it for about 50 million years. And we know that they send off an ultrasonic frequency above the range of human hearing. And they emit this, bounces off of the wall of a cave or a moth, as we see in this picture. That sound gets reflected back to them. And they can tell by how long the sound took to make that round trip out and back and how loud it was when it came back to them what types of objects are around them, and how far away they are. So about 50 million years later, humans caught on, and around World War I, we started using sonar underwater to the same ends that our bat friends did. The uh, uh, sound gets emitted from the submarine, bounces off the uh, ocean floor, bounces off other ships, or dolphins, or what have you, and again, it tells the operator of the sonar how far away objects are, and it tells them a little bit about the nature of the object given how bright the sound is when it comes back. In the 1950s, uh, doctors took over where the military left off, and we were able to detect uh, humans if we place a human in a large vat of water. That wasn't terribly clinically helpful, um, so thankfully by the 1980s, we developed portable ultrasound machines. And you can tell by this picture, portable meant um, usually about the size of a refrigerator and uh, able to be wheeled around to different parts of the hospital. The 1990s uh, saw the era of hand-carried ultrasound as, again, part of a military uh, initiative to bring ultrasound to the battlefield. And today, we see the descendants of these machines from several different vendors able to fit in the, uh, fit in the palm of your hand, um, able to get really good imaging uh, very rapidly with screen sizes that uh, rival the size of cell phones or tablet computers. So um, with this, we've seen ultrasound leave the hallowed halls of radiology and cardiology and obstetrics, um, who uh, really were the pioneers in the use of ultrasound in medicine, to being used by emergency physicians, intensivists, hospitalists, pediatricians, urologists, ear, nose, and throat, uh, pathologists, and uh, almost every specialty uh, in the United States and around the world are using point-of-care ultrasound to one extent or another. So um, back to the physics. Uh, I should have warned you there was going to be a history lesson there for a minute. We uh, are going to talk about the piezoelectric effect, which is basically how the transducer works. We're going to talk about waves, uh, which is the ultrasound energy that comes out of the end of the transducer. We'll talk about imaging. Sometimes people refer to this as uh, the knobology or the instrumentation as well. Basically how we get a good picture on the screen. And again, uh, instrumentation or how the knobs and dials on the machine work. So piezoelectric basically just means pressure electric. When you have a piezoelectric crystal, as we see here on the left-hand side of the screen, if you change its shape, it will uh, emit an electrical current. Uh, conversely, if you apply an electric current to a piezoelectric crystal, it will change shape. So the uh, ultrasound energy is basically created by uh, creating pulses of electrical energy onto piezoelectric crystals, which create an electrical, um, which create a, an ultrasound beam. And uh, then when that beam reflects back into the transducer, it creates vibrations which are perceived as electrical currents by the transducer. So here we see with the crystal is off, nothing happens. When the crystal is on and receives pulses of electricity, it pushes the molecules up against it. In our case, that's going to be uh, the molecules in the gel, in the uh, soft tissue, and the organs of the person that we're going to be scanning. And it squishes some of the molecules together and it allows other molecules to spread apart. And that creates a longitudinal wave, uh, which is just like uh, the stretched out uh, slinky that you might remember from your physics class. So inside the transducer, there's this piezoelectric crystal, and we pulse it with electrical waves, and as we do so, it uh, bounces in and out of the tissues. And uh, by doing so, that creates this image. And the beam basically scans from side to side, and it creates this two-dimensional grayscale ultrasound image uh, that we're used to looking at. <clears throat> so 
I'm reluctant to use the word Snell's Law, but here I am saying it. Um, Snell's Law has to do with what happens to sound as it goes from one density to another density. Um, in human body, things are a little bit simpler because we don't have to worry about an infinite number of possibilities for the densities. We are always starting with liquid density because the transducer and the gel and the um, initial soft tissue that you place the transducer up against are all going to be liquid density. So what happens in the middle here is when you look at, for example, the bladder, um, you are going from liquid density into other liquid density, and most of the beam continues on into the body, and very little of it gets reflected uh, at that uh, interface when you go down to the deeper tissues, because everything's pretty close to liquid density. This is why we want to look at organs in the body, because they're close to liquid dense. When we go to any extreme that's far away from the density of liquid, on the one end we see air on the left here, on the right side we see bone, so the least and the most dense things in the body. There's an enormous amount of reflection and refraction that takes place, so most of the ultrasound energy, if not all of it, bounces off that interface when you start off with liquid and you go to air, for example, almost all of the energy bounces back, so you don't really see anything that's deep to that air layer. And the same thing happens with bone. When ultrasound energy encounters bone, uh, it's traveling along in liquid. It sees a hugely different density of the bone, and almost all that energy reflects out and back, and you can't see anything deep to the bone. So we're going to try to stay uh, on liquid, uh, starting off with uh, a good window where we find a liquid structure in the body to image through, and trying to image liquid structures within the body for the most part. And as we're imaging these structures, it's worthwhile to look at the uh, nomenclature that we use to describe how bright things are. So um, since ultrasound works on relative densities and not absolute densities, meaning, as I described before, air and bone can look the same on ultrasound, despite the fact they look very different on CT scan or X-ray, we talk about echogenicity, which has to do with how bright a structure is, how much it reflects. So on this image, the hyperechoic areas are brighter. So for example, tracing along the pericardium here in this parasternal long axis view of the heart. The mitral valve here and here is pretty echogenic as well. It's hyperechoic. And uh, again, that's because it's thick and fibrous and a very much different density than the anechoic structures uh, that we see in here inside the chamber of the heart uh, in the right ventricle and the left ventricle which are black. So fluid is black on ultrasound. It doesn't attenuate or uh, reduce the ultrasound energy at all, and therefore the ultrasound beam doesn't reflect any information back in that area. If it doesn't reflect any information back, it shows up as black on the ultrasound. So hyperechoic is brighter than everything else. Anechoic is darker than everything else. And isoechoic means the same echogenicity as everything else. So for example, this muscle, this muscle, and this muscle, all different parts of the myocardium, are all the same as echogenicity, so they're isoechoic. I mentioned windows before, and ultrasound people love to talk about windows, but rarely do we tell you exactly what they are. So let's start off with an example from light. A window is a part of a building that allows light to pass through, so you can see stuff. Now you knew that already, you might not need to write it down, but when we move it into the realm of sonography, we have to think about acoustic windows. And an acoustic window is an area in the body that lets sound pass through so the beam can travel and you can see stuff inside the body. So it's the same idea. Ultrasound loves water. So water is going to act as an excellent sonographic window. So areas on the body that are organs or liquid-filled structures are generally where you're going to want to place the probe because that is going to allow all the sound energy to pass through to image things. Air is bad for imaging, so when you go to a place on the body, like over bowel gas or over um, the lung, when there's a lot of air, it's going to give you a very poor window. So here's an example of a sub view of the heart. We start where the arrow is on this uh, body form in the top left corner of the screen, and this is the image we're going to get. And it looks like an image of nothing. Um, but it's an image of nothing in the same way that Seinfeld was a show about nothing. There's really a little bit more going on beneath the surface here. So when we look in 
where the arrow is pointing, it's really pointing to the stomach. And the stomach shows up as this bright white reflector, and it casts these dirty shadows of different shades of gray down from it. So this is a terrible window. A little sliver on the side here, towards the right-hand side of the patient, or the left-hand side of the screen, is a little bit of liver. And the liver acts as a great acoustic window. So this is liver texture down here, and this is the beginning of the heart. Now you might not believe me, because we have to make the image look a little bit better. So let's move away from the area that is giving us poor window and move towards an area that's giving us a better window. So paradoxically, we're going to move further to the patient's right in order to image the heart, which is a bit of a left side structure. So as we move further to the patient's right and we get more and more and more liver in the near field, we start to see a really good window here, right underneath the transducer, which is allowing the sound energy to pass through so that we can get a good sub xiphoid four-chamber view of the heart. And now that little teeny bit of stomach that's left is still ruining this last little sliver of the image, but it doesn't matter anymore. This, by the way, down here is a mirror image artifact, and that basically is caused by uh, sound reflecting off the diaphragm, which causes the image of the liver up here, which is true, bounces back and forth off the diaphragm, and it causes a false, deeper image of the liver. So this fake liver down here is really just a reflection across the diaphragm, which is acting as a mirror of real liver tissue. So how do you position the patient when you actually perform the ultrasound? It's just like physical examination. You want to stand and face the patient um, and stand on the patient's right-hand side, Push the machine ahead of you into the patient bay. Like me, you work in cramped quarters. You're going to put the machine in front of you so that you're facing the machine and you're facing the patient. Your right hand then is free to hold the probe, and your left hand can work the buttons on the ultrasound machine. In my experience, most left-handed operators use ultrasound in their right hand, but a number of lefties also just switch everything around and hold the probe in their left hand, and they work the buttons on their right hand. So again, even with a handheld machine, you're going to hold the probe in your right hand and uh, hold the machine in your left, standing to the patient's right-hand side. So how do you hold the probe itself? Uh, one common thing that novices do is hold the probe uh, by uh, its tip, or they don't really stabilize their hand on the patient. You want to hold the probe the same way that you would hold a pencil. Let the heel of your hand, let your fourth and fifth fingers rest on the patient's body, which means you might have to actually touch them. And your first three fingers, your thumb, index, and, and middle finger, are going to stabilize the probe. Three fingers is plenty to stabilize a probe, no matter how small your hand is or how large the probe is. So if you focus on just holding the probe with those three fingers, it leaves you a lot of room with the rest of your hand to stabilize the probe. And this is going to help you uh, prevent you from sliding around on the patient and, uh, and losing track of where you are. So another thing that people do when they first start scanning is they sort of randomly move the probe around, which randomly changes the image that they get. And it's very difficult to create a pattern recognition for when I move my hand in this way, how does that change the image? So at some points the images look better or worse, but it's hard to know what you did to make the image look better or worse. So there's three different axes in space because we live in a three-dimensional world. And um, in the... Uh, in the Air Force, they would refer to this for an airplane, for example, as uh, pitch going up and down, yaw going side to side, and roll, which is spinning on an axis. I just like this because these are cool animations, um, but the idea is that you're moving in three different dimensions in space. You can think about this in terms of moving in the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. You can talk about uh, sliding and fanning, rolling. It doesn't really matter. The idea is as you're scanning, Try to optimize the pitch, for example, and when that looks about as good as it's going to get, then optimize the yaw, then optimize the roll. Optimize X, then Y, then Z. If you move your hand in one sort of range of motion at a time, it's a lot easier to get a sense for what that particular range of motion does to your image, and you'll get that proprioception much more quickly. So when you're holding the probe, you're going to notice that there's a marker on the probe. Every company is a bit different. Some of them have a little nubbin that sticks out the side, like on this device. Some of them actually have a glowing green dot, as opposed to adding it in, uh, in post-production here. Um, and that probe marker should be oriented in 
one of two different ways. If you're imaging in a sagittal plane or a coronal plane, you'd want that probe marker to be facing towards the patient's head. If you're imaging in a transverse plane, you want the probe marker to be facing towards the patient's right. There are a couple of exceptions to this, but these are the standard radiology views to ensure that your views are going to be the same as my views and the same as any textbook that you pick up. And when you hold the probe with that orientation, so here, for example, we're looking at the abdominal aorta, and we want to look at a sagittal view, so the probe marker is facing up towards the patient's head. And if the probe marker is facing towards the patient's head, and it corresponds to the probe marker, which is also this green dot on the screen, that means everything on the green dot side of the screen is also towards the patient's head. Anything on the opposite side of the head is towards the feet. The probe is touching the anterior abdomen, so the top of the screen is anterior, and it's shining ultrasound energy into the body. Therefore, everything in the far field on the bottom of the screen is posterior. If you scan in a transverse plane and you hold the probe towards the patient's right-hand side, you'll see that everything on the right-hand side, which is the dot side of the probe marker, corresponds to the dot side of the ultrasound screen. So that means that what you're looking at on the left is the patient's right-hand side. The opposite side is the left side. Again, the part that touches the patient is anterior, and the far field is posterior. This should remind you of the normal orientation of a CT scan image. So most of the time when you're doing a transverse view through the abdomen, you're going to get the same orientation into your slices that a CT scan slice in the axial plane will give you. So let's talk about machine controls now for a minute. A lot of the machines that you'll see in your departments are going to be um, very off-putting because they seem like there are just too many buttons. So let's go back to something that's a little bit simpler. Uh, even though DVDs are uh, going the way of the DVD player, I suppose, um, and very few people know what this thing is anymore because you have Netflix and Hulu, um, you know that the little square button means stop, and you know that the triangle means play. And this is true in every manufacturer. It's true in every country, in every language. So you can pull one of these guys out of the box, and you'll know power, play, pause, stop, forward, rewind, without having to read the manual. Not true with ultrasound machines. Every manufacturer has a different keyboard layout, different button orientation. It has sliders, it has knobs, it has track wheels. So we need to standardize uh, our interpretation of this a little bit because the manufacturers aren't going to standardize the buttons anytime soon. So when you go to your own institution and you look at your ultrasound machine, these are the buttons that you need to figure out. Have somebody show you or read the manual. Where's the power button? Which button lets me select a probe? How do I control the gain? The depth? And how do I freeze and save images? How do I store these images for later use? Maybe you'll want to know how to press the print button because you have a printer attached. But the idea is how do you save the images? <clears throat> so gain is basically the volume knob on the machine. It controls the amplitude of the signal. So on the left we see the image is too dark. On the right we see it's too bright. In the middle it's just right. Just like any good black and white photo, there should be black and white and shades of gray visible in the image. Depth controls how long the machine listens inside the body. The longer it listens, the deeper, basically, the machine um, can send that ultrasound energy. So we want to see structures that we're interested in. We want to see them completely, but we don't want to see anything extra. So here, for example, there's an image of liver and kidney. And here it's too small, and there it's too big, and maybe in the middle somewhere here it's just right. So you want to change the depth to the point where you can see the entire structure you're interested in, no more, no less. If you're interested to see how deep you are, in the bottom right-hand corner on almost every machine, there is a total depth. So this machine, for example, goes from 10 centimeters all the way up to about 24 centimeters in depth, and that means that each of these little white dots on the right-hand side of the screen represents one centimeter. And again, here on this machine as well, we can see the, um, the centimeter marks and a total of uh, the total depth on the bottom. So with that very rapid introduction to how ultrasound works in general and how you can pick up your machine when you get back to your own institution to scan somebody, let's give you a little something to scan.
Um, it's very difficult to decide which things might be your highest yield. In your institution, it might be venous access. It might be looking at pneumothorax. You might have a, a high yield for DVT studies or looking at first trimester pregnancy. Um, but going across multiple um, applications used through many different departments throughout the hospital, uh, it's really common that people would want to evaluate a patient, for example, who's short of breath. Um, so we're going to talk about the heart a little bit. We're going to focus just on contractility and effusion, and um, let's start with that. So there's a couple of different uh, axes that we image the heart through. A long axis, which uh, runs along the long axis of the heart from the atria to the ventricles and out through the tip of the apex. That's in this cyan-colored uh, box here. A short axis is also commonly used to assess cardiac contractility, looking through the ventricles, and that's this yellow plane that we see drawn here. And finally, a four-chamber view, again, very commonly used in cardiology, intensive care, emergency medicine, and other specialties. That's this green plane here, and this cuts through, a again, a four-chamber view of the heart where you can see both atria and both ventricles. The cardiology convention, when you're in cardiac mode on the ultrasound machine, is that you're going to have the probe marker, uh, again, either up towards the patient's head or off to the patient's right-hand side. The, uh, this varies a little bit uh, between uh, ICU, emergency medicine, cardiology, um, and uh, when you do a hands-on ultrasound experience, you can go over the different uh, conventions with, uh, with the instructor. So, placing the probe marker towards the patient's right-hand side and the probe itself in the subxiphoid view, we get to see this uh, subxiphoid four-chamber view. This was the same view that we were using before to demonstrate the window. And the window here is the liver. So the fact that I can see a little bit of liver up here in the near field means I'm going to get a good picture of, from anterior to posterior, the right ventricle, the right atrium, the septum, the left ventricle, the left atrium, and in a really good four-chamber view, you'll be able to see the tricuspid valve and the mitral valves as well. This is a schematic demonstrating where we're slicing through the heart and the schematic of the chambers that we would normally see. And this is what a normal sub view should look like. We can see that the uh, heart muscle is beating, con uh, contracting towards the center of the chamber pretty well. Um, we see that uh, all four chambers are moving. We can see the border of the heart here, the pericardium, that it's bright white and that there is no fluid within that pericardial sac. And we can see that the fluid inside the heart is black, as it should be, which means the machine is calibrated well. We see the liver is gray. The uh, inside of the atria and the ventricles are black, and the pericardium is white. So the dynamic range on this image is, is very good. Another very commonly used view is a parasternal long axis view, holding the probe along the long axis of the heart. And the cardiology orientation would be that you would hold the probe marker up towards the patient's right shoulder. But the plane of the ultrasound beam should be along the long axis, so it extends out towards the apex. And when you do that, uh, you're basically using the chest wall as uh, a window, and you're looking directly down into the RV outflow tract anteriorly. Deep to that, you see the septum. Deep to that, you see the entire left ventricle with the LV outflow tract and the aortic valve, anterior to the mitral valve and the left atrium. And notice this gives you a picture when you hold the probe marker up towards the patient's right side. It gives you a picture that is opposite in terms of left-right orientation. Uh, compared to how the patient's oriented in real life, and this is just a consequence of um, a cardiology convention that started back in the 1970s where uh, patients used to be imaged uh, from the patient's head. So if you were facing the patient's feet, you would uh, have the patient's left ventricle towards your left side, and therefore on the screen you would have the left ventricle or the apex towards your left side as well. As we grew towards moving, uh, towards imaging patients uh, facing them, we kept that convention. So depending on where you then uh, turn your probe, you can take a long axis view that we see pictured on top and rotate into this short axis view, which is through the mitral valve, the left ventricle, and the right ventricle. If you go a bit more apical towards the edge of the heart, you'll see a view of the left ventricle with the papillary muscles 
and the right ventricle on top. And if you go towards the base of the heart or the annulus fibrosis, you'll see a bit of the RV outflow track here and the uh, aortic valve and the, um, the left atrium uh, in this view. So depending on what you're looking at, you can slice different short axis views. So let's just take a moment to look at contractility. There are three things we want to focus on for contractility. One is, are the walls all coming together pretty symmetrically towards the center? So this little hand now is in the center of the left ventricle, and we can see that both the septum and the posterior wall are coming together symmetrically towards that center. So that looks pretty good. The next thing is, is this heart muscle um, thickening as it contracts? Because there's no difference between septum and bicep or quadriceps muscle in the sense that when it contracts, it should thicken. So we see that every time systole is happening, the muscle is contracting and thickening, and the posterior wall is contracting and thickening. Scar tissue won't do that. So that's another thing to check for. And finally, since we know that the amount of blood coming into the heart during diastole should equal the amount of blood going out of the heart during systole, if we can tell that a bunch of blood is coming into the heart during diastole, then we know that there's a good ejection fraction. One way to look at this is to look at the separation of the septum up here to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which is down here. And we look at the septal separation during the E point of the cardiac cycle, which is the point of atrial kick. So the latter part of diastole, when the mitral valve opens wider, we want to see if the mitral valve gets within a couple of millimeters of the septum. And here, for example, we can see that it's actually touching the septum. So again, E point septal separation, or EPSS, on its own can be a good marker for ejection fraction. So we're not only looking here to see that there's no pericardial effusion, no blackness outside of the heart within the pericardium. We're looking to see that the ventricle contracts symmetrically towards the center and that the valve is opening wide open during diastole. So this is a good ejection fraction. We're also looking for effusion. So here, for example, we can see the heart beating in the center of the pericardium, and there's this large black stripe of fluid all around it. This is a pericardial effusion. And we can see even as the operator here is moving a bit more towards an apical view, we can see that there's fluid surrounding the heart. When that fluid uh, creates enough pressure around the heart, we'll start to see tamponade. And that will create uh, a pressure on the right ventricle, which is a lower pressure ventricle. And we can see that this area here anteriorly, which should uh, we should see the ventricle uh, going out and in as it uh, contracts and expands during systole and diastole. And instead, the amount of pressure on it from the outside is forcing it downwards. Um, it's been described by some people as um, a heavy uh, kid on a trampoline. Um, and here, in this case, it looks like the trampoline is not rising up at all. So we see this large effusion, which you need for tamponade, and also the fact that the right ventricle is almost entirely obliterated by the pressure. And here, even though the view of the heart is not very good, we can see a heart that's trying very hard to beat. We can see ventricles that aren't opening very well, uh, that aren't able to fill, and we see a very large pericardial effusion. So this sub view, the heart looks like a little fist trying to contract, and the pressure around the outside of it is just too great. So this is another very flagrant example of tamponade. And here we see tamponade um, with, um, with the heart swinging back and forth. And that swinging back and forth should remind you of um, the variable QRS complex amplitude that you will sometimes see with pericardial tamponade. So you can imagine that the rhythm strip on this patient would show a taller and then a shorter and then a taller QRS complex as the heart swings back and forth. So let's look at another couple of examples of cardiac contractility here. So here we're not seeing much motion towards the center of the ventricle. The walls aren't moving very much. We're seeing almost no thickening with the contractions during systole. And the mitral valve itself here is barely opening. 
This is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is the part of the septum that it should be nearly touching. So we see that the E-point septal separation is several centimeters as opposed to being just a few millimeters. So this is very poor contractility that you would see with a patient with congestive heart failure, uh, something with scarring after myocardial infarction. And here again, we see another heart that looks like it's working pretty hard to beat. And when you look at it at first, it seems like it's doing pretty well. But then you see that the septum here is only sort of moving back and forth. It's not really thickening as it contracts. There's not a lot of organized motion towards the center of the ventricle. And the mitral valve, again, is only getting about halfway in between the posterior wall of the ventricle and the septum. So there's poor E-point septal separation, there's poor concentric contractility, and there's very poor uh, thickening with contraction. So again, another example that might fool the eye at first, showing you poor contractility. In contrast, here we see a hyperdynamic heart. This is a heart that does not have enough fluid to work with in a patient who is uh, probably um, uh, fluid depleted um, or, uh, or might have a sepsis. So this patient either has an absolute or a relative volume depletion, and they're going to respond to fluids a lot better than they're going to respond to inotropes or chronotropes. And we can see that the muscles are thickening, there's a lot of movement towards the center, the walls of the ventricle are almost touching each other, and uh, the septum is, um, is practically being slapped by the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve here. So this is a patient who, uh, if they've already received some fluids in your initial resuscitation, they need more fluids. And here we see a similar patient with a hyperdynamic heart. This is a subxiphoid view. We see all the ventricles working really hard, contracting very well. They just need more fluid to work with. So how can we put together uh, a picture of congestive heart failure by looking at the lungs as well? Uh, we know what ultrasound, uh, we know what a chest X-ray looks like for pulmonary edema, um, but there are actually um, other things that you can see on ultrasound that will give you a sense that there is uh, pulmonary edema. So um, there's a lot of different ways that people have used to look at the lungs. Um, we can look at zone one, uh, two, and three, which is probably the simplest way to do it because it only means you need to look in three different areas on each side of the chest, moving from the sternal border all the way to the anterior axillary line in zone one. Zone two is from the anterior to the posterior axillary line. And zone three is anything posterior to the posterior axillary line. And really the simplest way to do this is to look at zone one and two. And if you find what you're looking for, you can stop. If you find pathology, if everything looks normal so far, then you'll need to move into zone three. So when you look at normal lung, you're going to see a, um, uh, a reverberation artifact um, coming from the pleura. And that is caused by the uh, ultrasound energy bouncing off the pleura. And when it bounces off once, it leads the machine to create a single bright white line here. But it's such a bright reflector here, it's such a bright reflector at the skin, that sometimes the ultrasound energy sometimes bounces twice back and forth. And that will create uh, another bright white line twice as deep. If it bounces back and forth three times, you know, three, it'll lead to a third line, which is, again, equidistant. So these are referred to as A-lines, and they are normal. A-lines are horizontal lines. They are parallel to the pleura, and they represent a normal lung interface. In contrast, B-lines arise from the pleura. They are laser-like, extend in a bright white line all the way down to the edge of the field, and they represent pulmonary edema. Normal alveoli are very thin-walled and have uh, air, large air spaces. When there's pulmonary edema, the interlobular septa become edematous, and ultrasound energy can bounce back and forth between the walls here that are basically fluid-filled, and they can create that artifact. So when the pleura is normal, this air interface just creates uh, a back and forth reflection between the skin and the pleura and again and again and again and that's what creates these large widely spaced concentric artifacts. When you have a smaller back and forth bouncing between the interlobular septa you'll see 
many, many, many more iterations of this artifact happening one right on top of another, which leads to the perception of a vertical line instead of a horizontal line, and those are B lines. So here we see normal plural line, and the same distance between the pleura and the skin, we see our first A line. The same distance again, we see our second A line. So this is normal lung. When there's fluid, we will see many, many B lines coming down. Again, these bright white lines arising from the pleura, this very tiny reverberation artifact extending all the way to the edge. These areas of bright white with shadow behind them are ribs. So up top here, we see subcutaneous tissue, rib and rib and pleura, and then below the pleura, all these B lines, which are indicative of pulmonary edema. So hopefully this gets you started. It gives you uh, an overview of what ultrasound does, how it works, and finally, what it can be used for. The heart and lung examination uh, can be very complicated. They can take a long time to master, but hopefully this will give you a sense of something to start for because most of your patients are going to have either hearts or lungs for you to practice on. So uh, please contact me at my ultrasound division website, sinaem.us with questions, concerns. I also have other videos and tutorials available on the site. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Portland uh, if we haven't met yet. And if you're reviewing this after we saw each other in Portland, again, feel free to contact me anytime with questions as you go back to your home institution and hopefully start using ultrasound to care for your patients. Thank you.